Good morning. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. We will sing to the Lord as long as we live. We will, we will sing, sing to, to the Lord, Lord while, while we have being. God send forth the Spirit and all is made new. May, May the, the glory, glory of the Lord, Lord endure, endure forever. Shannon, would you like to get us started on our hymn of praise? Our opening hymn today is going to be number 383. This is the day of new beginnings. and peace in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to our gathering for worship this morning. Honestly, it's uh, very different looking out. It's uh, a cross between church and a scene from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Especially, I think Gary has the, uh, the definitely the more outlaw mask of everybody. I thought about having a mask uh, fashion show and giving a, a prize for the, uh, uh, the best mask out there, but uh, we'll pass on that. But it has been three long months. What began hopefully as two weeks has extended to 12. Seems a bit like Gilligan's Island, a three-hour cruise ending up being a long time away. So it is wonderful to see some folks here in worship today. We are socially distanced, spread out, pews are closed off, people are wearing their masks. If you come in the door, we say let us spray and you get uh, uh, hand sanitizer. We're trying to do everything we can to keep everybody safe. There are no registration of attendance pads, just like there are no Bibles and no hymnals. So uh, Walter and Betty are just going to count folks, and we'll try to remember who was here. We're going to do our best on that. But um, uh, I am going to ask you all to do me a favor henceforward. That is, if you hadn't already, bring your Bible with you. That'll be bringing your Bible to church anyway. Good opportunity to figure out where it is. So bring your own Bible. If you have your own hymnal, you can bring it. That's the second thing I want to mention real quickly with regard to singing. We're discouraging congregational singing. And I know that is heresy in the Methodist church. We're Wesleyans. We like to sing. What I'm going to say is if you're going to sing, uh, try to uh, keep it down a little bit and consider where your uh, droplets may be going. That's kind of a terse way of putting that. But we're going to spread out as much as we can. The last thing we want to do is get anybody sick. So uh, if you're here, uh, 
just be cognizant. I see everybody wearing their masks, and I really do appreciate that. And I am thrilled to see folks back in the congregation. Not only is the sanctuary a little more sterile, we've had to eliminate a few things. There's not going to be a greeting. Uh, Carolyn caught herself just at the last minute. We're, we're hugging and, you know, uh, greeting and pa peace passing folks. Can't do that. So one of the things you'll see is the offering plate is up here. We're not going to be passing the offering plate. So either uh, before the service, right after the service, or during the offering time, you can come up and put your offering in the plate. We will be doing the uh, communion again as we did last month with the little pods, the little uh, all-in-one cups. And for those watching at home, I want to assure you Beth and I will stay until 1 o'clock today. Out, we will be out front. If you want to come by and get your communion elements, we will give them to you. And we'll be happy to do that for those who come by. I need you to do me a favor with communion. Everybody's going to get their communion element in a Ziploc baggie. So it doesn't get contaminated by anybody else. They've been, in, with great care, sealed up in baggies. And uh, if uh, it's just one of you, you get a bag with one. If you're a couple, you get a bag with two. And if you're here, here's what I want you to do. Once you get it, once everybody has them, we're going to consume them together at the same time. But then I want you to save the Ziploc bag, put your empty and the trash in it, seal it up, and take it with you. You can recycle it at home. Take it with you when you're done. So, again, trying to maintain as close to a sanitary environment as we can. And we'll put those Ziploc bags to, to good use that way. So singing, communion, passing the peace, offering. Have I forgotten anything? Well, how about this? Welcome everybody. Whether you're here in person, you're watching on the Zoom teleconference, which has fewer folks this week because we have more folks here or you're watching us on Facebook Live, we're glad that you're with us wherever you are. And again, we are going to do our best to extend the communion table to you. So make plans to come see us after church to get your communion elements. If there are no other announcements, it is Communion Sunday. So if uh, you all will, join, will listen to and then respond accordingly to our invitation to Holy Communion. Charlie, if you'll advance the slide, please. Oh, and if you are on Facebook Live, do me a favor and make sure you leave a comment so we can count you in attendance. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. This is a challenging time for forgiveness. But perhaps the most powerful words that I've read, St. Paul said, for Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. Take just a moment and share a few uh, announcements uh, with you of what's going to be going on. We are going to be a little different in our layout in worship today. Uh, Shannon's going to be singing and leading songs from the uh, uh, choir loft, and uh, I'll be preaching from the pulpit, so that'll be kind of different for, uh, for everybody. But a uh, couple of, of important announcements to let you know about. First and foremost, uh, a reminder that uh, we will be having our brown bag Bible study continuing this Thursday at 12 noon, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, please make plans to join us. It is my intention to, as soon as practicable, 
hopefully before the end of the summer, be able to open that up for both in-person and uh, uh, remote participation. But right now it remains remote uh, as, as it is right now. An encouragement for anybody watching us on the, the two streams to be sure to send an email uh, to uh, FUMC Lady, FUMC Lady at BrazoriaINet.com. And uh, we'll get you on our mailing list so that you can get the announcements and uh, calendars and bulletins and other activities, the daily devotional, which hopefully, if my computer will cooperate, we will have one for tomorrow. If not, I have a new computer coming, which will hopefully remedy that problem once and for all in that fight and getting that out. But we need to get you on our mailing list for you all to be able to receive all of that. Also, it is, uh, uh, would be important to remind you all, first to say thanks to everyone who has continued to support us or who has begun to support us during the uh, time of our COVID shutdown financially, as well as with prayers and presence, service and witness. And we ask you to uh, prayerfully consider uh, continuing making a gift to support our ministry here and uh, you can do that. Charlie, can you put up that uh, announcement slide? Just so people can, can have that on uh, giving. Nope, maybe not. All right, there we go. I knew it was there somewhere. A couple of different ways that you can do that. Uh, text to give at 979-227-3803. Uh, go to our church website, which at the moment has crashed hard, and I don't know what's happened. Normally, if you go to our website and just click the uh, donate button, you can't do that, or at least you couldn't as of about 9 a.m. this morning. You can mail it, snail mail, to the address on your screen, P.O. Box 9, Brazoria, or drop it by the church office, and we will be glad to put that in the, uh, the plate as well. All right, the one other thing is, and this should be a real challenge in, the, uh, in this time of, of COVID and, and everything else, but we cannot, as a church, res, you know, cease to be the church, and by that I mean providing our uh, uh, ministry to those, the least, the lost, the last, and so forth. So this Friday afternoon, the event actually starts at 4 o'clock, but we need our volunteers there between, say, 3 and 3.30. It's going to be hot. I hope they do it underneath the trees like they did last summer. But uh, it's going to be hot, and uh, so come prepared for that. But we need volunteers. Bring your mask so that we can continue to provide uh, food uh, to um, our, need, our needy uh, members of our community. This is a really important community ministry. So if you're available uh, to come on Friday afternoon, put your shorts and something cool on, bring a big hat and come uh, help us hand out uh, the food uh, in uh, association with uh, Brass's Pork Cares Food Pantry. I believe that's all the announcements that I'm aware of. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. And Shannon is has... Oh, there's... And that brings up two points. One is, thanks to Gail Black, in, in the back we do have some masks, uh, home, very nice uh, masks. Uh, they're in a basket, individually wrapped, and you can take one home. They are not disposable. Take them home, cherish them, love them, care for them, wear them. Uh, they're in a basket as you go out the door. And Shannon has been crafty and um, busy and she is making masks and she will make custom sized masks. Those are the little munchkin sized masks and she also has some uh, huge masks and everywhere in between she'll make, if you're interested, see Shannon and she can get the measurements for your little one or grandchild or whatever and, and or somebody who's uh, big and, and needs a, a big mask. So Shannon, thank you. And again, I really do appreciate everybody uh, wearing their mask. I got to tell you, I'm not enjoying, <laughs> not enjoying wearing mine 
with my glasses fogging every time I breathe, but uh, it is uh, important, and uh, again, I appreciate everyone uh, doing that. Any other announcements? Well, then let's share in our prayer hymn as we bring ourselves, our uh, hearts and our minds into an attitude of prayer. Our prayer hymn today is going to be number 620, One Bread, One Body. realize there's an error in the bulletin and it was my doing and that is we forgot the offertory are you still willing to sing an offertory okay she's going to run to her car so you don't need okay we'll just play the doxology then that's cool we'll work it out okay that was my goof, my apologies. No, nope, no, we're not quite ready for the doxology yet. We gotta do our prayer first, but I just realized we were missing something. You know what? We are out of practice doing this. We are, we are really struggling here. We had it down when nobody was here, you know, that's because everything was pre-recorded and you know, it was deep faked or whatever. Oh, goodness, friends, this, it, it feels so good to have people back, but uh, it's also uh, a, little, uh, a little unsettling. So. But we have come to our prayer time, and uh, we are celebrating the Pentecost today, where we see the, res or we saw 
in the, the scriptures. The work of prayer. Jesus told the disciples to go back to Jerusalem and wait and pray. And they went back and they waited and they prayed without ceasing. And then we saw what happened on the Pentecost when the Lord really blew the doors off the church. Well, friends, our world needs the doors blown off. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to touch lives today and even more so today and in the days to come. So let us bow and be at one as we're the disciples in one accord that morning. Creator God, you have made all the things of the earth and we, your children, among them. We come this day filled with praise and thanksgiving for your marvelous works. Not only have you made us, but you sustain us as well. You open your hand and all that live are filled with good things. Holy and gracious is your name. Redeemer God, you came as one of us to free us from our sin. You promised that we would be filled, that all our needs would be met if we only would have faith. But we are so often a faithless people. You made us a people of many colors and many tongues. But we too often use our differences to divide us. You have poured out many gifts for all. But tragically, we do not trust their variety or apparently your wisdom. Forgive us our selfish and destructive ways and renew the face of the earth. As you poured out your spirit in the creation and again on the Pentecost, fill us once more with that same spirit that we might receive and use your sovereign power to build up your church on earth and to recover the unity which we've lost. That all may proclaim one Lord, crucified and risen for all. And our God, in giving us so great a gift, you've also given us a great responsibility to care for one another. As we are filled with breath and illuminated by your fire, so bring to bear that same grace and power upon those who this day suffer in body or mind or spirit. Receive them in your mercy and make them whole. Hear us, good Lord, as we offer our prayers. For our sister Shirley Fitzgerald, for strength, mobility, and good health. Lord, in your mercy. For, Bill, for our brother Bill Davidson, for strength and mobility. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Joy Allman, for continued good health and for good spirits. Lord, in your mercy. For our brother Bill James, for healing. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Betty Johnson, for peace and for comfort. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Dorothy Richter, for healing. Lord, in your mercy. For our brother Wyatt Pierce, for healing. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Lacey Swango for successful surgery. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Patty Eves for healing. Lord, in your mercy. 
for our brother James Slaughter for successful surgery. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister June Bozeman for healing. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister Melissa Wilcher to recover from the COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy. For the family of our sister Helen Tony, for peace, comfort, and assurance, Lord, in your mercy. For the family of our sister Jackie Gotcher, for peace, comfort, and assurance, Lord, in your mercy. For our brother John Woods, for healing, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Hear us, O oh God, as together we pray for the concerns of our local communities. And we pray for peace, just and lasting. We pray for an end to injustice and exclusion. And we pray that we might be granted the privilege of seeing the goodness of your creation, our God, through the eyes given us, the eyes of Jesus given to us through grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us as we pray for the world, its people, and its leaders, and we pray for continued health and healing from the terrible COVID pandemic as well as we pray for peace, justice, and hope among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us as we pray for our church, the United Methodist Church, for our Bishop Scott, for our Superintendent Anthony, for laity and for clergy as we work through our present day challenges Help us to be your church. Lord, in your mercy. And hear us as we pray for the universal church that we might truly be without labels the body of Christ on earth. Lord, in your mercy. And hear us as we pray for the great communion of saints. For our sister Helen Tony. Lord, in your mercy. For our sister, Jackie Gotcher. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. We pray this in every prayer in the name of the risen one, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we pray with boldness his prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
Again, we will be, we do practice an open communion table in the United Methodist Church. You need not be a member of this church or any church to receive at the Lord's table. Oh, do we have a hymn first? We sure do. I'm in the wrong place. I'm still messing up today. Must be stage fright, looking out at real people <laughs> instead of empty pews. We started uh, uh, something during the uh, uh, hiatus, and that was that we would sing a traditional Methodist hymn uh, when we didn't have a choir. So today is a very Pentecostal one by Charles Wesley. It's going to be uh, number 385, Let Us Plead for Faith Alone. Try again. See if I can get it right this time. Just to be on the safe side, I'll use a little bit more of that. So I said before, we practice an open communion table. Everyone is equally invited to receive and to facilitate reaching everyone we will serve those who are here today in person during the service, and then Beth and I will be available to uh, distribute the elements until one o'clock uh, in front of the church. So if you have, you're not here but would like to come and receive, we will be happy to provide the elements to you. The Lord, oh, there we go, thank you, Charlie. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have blessed all your creation and called it very good. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ who lived and died that we might inherit your spirit. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made a new covenant by water, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which our Lord gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Will you join with me in our prayer after receiving? Because the broken bread has meant our healing. Because the outpoured cup has meant our life. Because our common sharing has meant the communion of our souls. And because we have been graced by your presence, Lord. We give you thanks and pray that our lives may be renewed in the life and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Open, Lord, my eyes that I may see. Open, Lord, my ears that I may hear. Open, Lord, my heart and mind that I may understand. So shall I turn to you and be healed. Amen. Scripture today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. The interpretation is from the message. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks. And they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't, for the life of them, figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of, the Lib of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning and they couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked. They're drunk, drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people are not drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. The grass, grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I gather things have changed rather dramatically since the day of the Pentecost. People being drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning, I think that's a little more common now apparently than it was uh, 2,000 years ago. But I think we are all sober and uh, gathered here to hear the good news. Well, I read once that two people were talking together in front of a church that was on fire. 
The first man spoke in a voice which could be heard above the voice of the fireman saying, This is the first time I ever saw you at church. To this the second responded, This is the first time I ever saw the church on fire. Well, Pentecost is a day of spiritual fire. God setting a light the previously rather docile and depending on the gospel you read, rather confused and misunderstanding disciples waiting to find out what they were supposed to do or busy quarreling or asking strange questions or being continually surprised by what Jesus could do. But on Pentecost, God raised the stakes and he, survived, he surprised them all. Today is a day for God to surprise us. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart here be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, up front, it is in the Christian calendar for this year. Pentecost was last Sunday. So anybody watching at home, we realized this, but we thought this would be an appropriate occasion and scripture for us trying to come back together to try to relight some fires here amidst pandemic and all the other issues. But for us here at First United Methodist Church, today is Pentecost. It is a word that comes from the Greek meaning 50th. And today, approximately, it's the 50th day since the Passover, also Easter. And on the day of Pentecost, which was an important Jewish holiday in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, Sometime before 9 o'clock in the morning, approximately one week past our Lord's ascension, the disciples came together, as one translation puts it, in one accord, and you know the rest. There was a sound like a mighty wind blew through the building and through that upper room. There were tongues of fire that descended to the heads of the disciples. And then they did something truly extraordinary. They began preaching and teaching and witnessing to a diverse audience in that audience's own language. It was so striking extraordinary and powerful that the crowd thought they were drunk. Now Peter, well his name was Simon, but he got the nickname Rock, and I don't think he got the nickname Rock because he was so solid, because if you read, Simon Peter is the one who would deny Jesus three times. He was the one Jesus had to rebuke. He was the one that took his eyes off of Jesus and almost drowned, well, like a rock. I think he got the name because he was a rather dense individual, hard and tough. So Peter, who had denied Jesus, who could not even use the word agape with our Lord after his resurrection, that same Peter stood up and preached a sermon. And about 3,000 people were baptized into the Jesus movement that very day. It was no small event. And I'd like you brothers and sisters to think for a moment of the disciples, say at about 8.30 that morning, they were 12 Individuals. Actually, I think there were 11 of them there. But anyway, uh, they were individuals. Difficult even competing with one another, it seems. 
They each seem to have their own vision and understanding of what had happened with Jesus, their own agenda, their own motives. And they were in one room, but I think it is safe to say they were far from in one accord. In short, my friends, they were a lot like us, although they probably weren't wearing masks. They might have been. They probably weren't. They were a lot like us, bewildered sinners trying to make sense of our world in the context of the resurrection. You ought to be doing that rather regularly. What does it mean to be Easter people, to live the resurrection? What does that mean? And they were ordinary folks that were about, who had been and will continue to encounter a singular series of events. And at the same time, trying to envision a new and changing reality. I bring us back to the masks. Things are different. There have been a unique series of events we've been going through. I don't think any of us has ever tried to do church through a pandemic. There may be one or two or a few dozen or a few thousand, I don't know, folks that are still with us who lived through the uh, flu pandemic of, eight, of 1918, but not very many, and certainly not very many that would actually have remembered it. This is a singular series of events we've been through, just like the disciples. So there they were, 8.30 in the morning, waiting, anticipating. Is it going to happen now? Didn't happen yesterday. Didn't happen the day before. Didn't happen the day before that. Is it, is it going to happen today? I'd like to think that the disciples were a bit on the edge of their chairs and their seats. Is it going to happen now? Is this going to be the time? Jesus told us what was going to happen, but he refused to say when. And then, boom, the doors and windows were blown open. An anointing with fire and spirit. And an equipping of disciples for a broad, diverse, and international, universal even, ministry. And apparently, good old Rocky, good old Simon Peter, had a profound vision and began the second best sermon in the Bible. Do we have any guesses on the number one? Thank you very much. Somebody get paying attention. Sermon on the Mount. There you go. God was telling, showing, terrifying the disciples into opening up to the world and ministering to all without fear. It was a a new day, a new way. They were no longer to hide in fear, but preach unconstrained, boldly to any and everyone. Something really happened. And Bishop Bob Morgan in his book, Who's Coming to Dinner, told a powerful story about a Dutch pastor and his family who during the First World War got in trouble with the Nazis. They had been hiding Jewish people in their homes and the Gestapo found out and one night in darkness they heard the sound of heavy boots and the loud impatient pounding on the door. They were arrested and loaded into a cattle car to be taken to one of the notorious death camps. All night long the Dutch pastor and his family rode along in heartbreaking anguish, jostling against one another and against the other prisoners who were jammed into the cattle car. They were stripped of any form of dignity and absolutely terrified. They just knew they were being taken to one of Hitler's extermination centers. Would it be Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau? Finally, the long night ended and the train stopped. The doors of the cattle car were open and light streamed into that awful and tragic scene. They were marched out and lined up beside the railroad tracks, resigned to unspeakable pain 
as they knew they would be separated from each other and ultimately murdered. But in the midst of their gloom, they discovered some amazing good news. Good news beyond belief. They discovered in the bright morning sunlight that they were not in a death camp at all. Not in Germany at all. They were rather in Switzerland. During the night, someone through personal courage and daring had tripped a switch and sent the train to Switzerland and freedom. And now, those now who came to them were not their captors, but their liberators. And they were welcomed into new life. In the midst of his joy and relief, the Dutch pastor said, And what do you do with such a gift? Something like that happened to the disciples at the Pentecost. Somebody, God, threw a switch. And everything was different. Everything they had anticipated, everything they had planned for, everything they expected was different. And suddenly this all too timid Simon Peter, whom Jesus had literally once rebuked as Satan, stood before the crowd and boldly preached a prophetic sermon with power and authority. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boy, Simon Peter found his voice, didn't he? The Holy Spirit had emboldened Peter and equipped him and the other disciples with the gift of communication so that they could preach and witness to that diverse and international crowd. They went from being timid disciples to bold apostles singing their own version of the angel's song to the shepherds at Bethlehem. They went from being more or less passive followers of Jesus to active apostles reaching out to the world with the gospel. And as Luke tells us, it worked. 3,000 people saved and baptized. But Jesus told them it was going to happen. He said at his ascension, he told them to wait and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and well it happened and it hasn't stopped believe it or not friends God is still pouring out the Holy Spirit and all flesh on us here and now and everywhere sons and daughters still prophesy and young men and women continue to see visions and thankfully our old men and women continue to dream dreams Peter's sermon still echoes, if we will but listen. Now, admittedly, our world is far more complex than the first century one. Science, telecommunications, travel, medicine, finance, politics, nuclear war, and so on. But like the disciple apostles, we need, and like the people, all the people in every time, we need to make sense of our complex world. And as Christians, we need to do it in the context of one event, the resurrection. And well, Simon Peter's sermon can help if we'll let it. 
Friends, we need to experience a Pentecost ourselves. A Pentecost moment. The experience of God blowing the doors off. That wildness of the Spirit. What the Celtic Christians referred to as a wild goose. Squawking, and honking, and moving its wings and disrupting our normal, ordinary routine with the truly unexpected. A bit of geography. Did you know that the southernmost point of Africa has for centuries experienced tremendous storms? Of course you have, right? And for many years, no one even knew what was beyond that point because nobody ever made it around there. It was known as the Cape of Storms for good reason. You just didn't go there. Not going to go there. Wouldn't be prudent. But then a Portuguese explorer in the 16th century, Vasco da Gama, successfully sailed around the Cape of Storms and found that beyond the wild and raging storms, a great calm sea awaited. And beyond that, the shores and the riches of India. The name of that cape was changed then from the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. Well, friends, until Jesus Christ rose from the dead, death had been the Cape of Storms upon which all hope of life beyond was wrecked. You just didn't go there. And no one knew what lay beyond that point until that Easter morning when rolling that stone away, Jesus showed us. His disciples trembled in fear. Jesus spoke risen and alive. And Christ turned their cape of storms into a cape of good hope. Well, Pentecost, friends, was the disciple apostles' cape of new hope. And it should be ours. Hear Simon Peter's words again and take them to heart, friends. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Friends, we need vision. And we need dreams. And we need to look beyond nightmares, the cape of storms, into good hope. Unfortunately, friends, not only are we not necessarily seeing those visions and dreaming dreams, I suggest that even the church has at times put floodgates on the Pentecost spirit. You know what floodgates are? Those are those big heavy gates that hold back things. Hopefully to prevent floods, although we saw in Harvey that that doesn't always uh, work the way it is supposed to. Floodgates have been put on that Pentecost spirit. Floodgates such as money and practicality, logistics, politics, language, Rivalry, envy, hatred, even between churches and church-going people. We are limiting God. We are saying, look, yeah, the Pentecost is great, but we don't really have time. Why? Because we don't have time to do what it calls us to do, which is change the world. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we say, no. Simon Peter preached a good sermon, but not going to go there. We're going to keep these doors closed. We're, gonna we're going to refuse. I even saw years ago somebody wrote a very clever statement about a church budget. It said a church budget is a church's statement to God as to how much of his grace and providence we're willing to expect in the year to come. No, I now, I don't believe in being irresponsible, but to a large degree, the church should be fueled 
by that Pentecost fire, by that mighty wind, disrupting, disrupting the world of sin and fatalism with that honking wild goose of resurrection and eternal life. So my friends, in light of pandemic, in spite of masks and hand sanitizer, in the face of protests and disruption and violence and injustice, in the face of war and terrorism and hatred, the face of all of that, we need to ask God to remove the floodgates as he did with the disciples so that we might reach our world. We need to ask God in the spirit of Pentecost to blow the doors off First United Methodist Church of Brazoria, this community, our nation, and the world to remove our fetters and our excuses and put us to work with power and authority through the Holy Spirit. Friends, God has promised through the prophets that he will. Malachi says, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. We're not tempting our, the Lord our God, but merely asking God to empower and impentecost us to minister like there's an eternity of tomorrow's. Asking God to remove the impediments to ministry, to grant us a vision of the kingdom and our role in building it and opening the heavenly floodgates. Blessing. That, my friends, is Pentecost. And that's what Peter was preaching about. One of my favorite poets is William Blake. Uh, Wendy, he's one of your favorites too, you just don't know it. Because there was a young scholar at Oxford in the early 1960s by the name of Chris Christofferson who did his master's degree on uh, William Blake. So I knew you'd be a Blake fan now. So Wendy back there is a William Blake fan. William Blake wrote this poem about Pentecost. And it wrote a poem about Pentecost. And part of it says, unless the eye catches fire, God will not be seen. Unless the ear catch fire, God will not be heard. Unless the tongue catch fire, God will not be named. And unless, he says, unless the heart catch fire, God will not be loved. Unless the mind catch fire, God will not be known. I say, friends, Simon Peter found his voice. Let's find ours. Let's open those floodgates and make known our loving and gracious God to all creation. Peter spoke up. Now it's our turn. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I tell you what, this is really hard. To do keep this all on and that little earphone and everything else our closing hymn today is we're just going to do the first and last stanzas of 539 O Spirit of the Living God and if there's anyone here today or online would like to unite with us by any means by which we're able to accept members if you're here you can come on down if you're not here send us an email or send us a message and I will um, be uh, glad to uh, reach out to you and bring you on board. So 539. <laughs>
thank everybody for worshiping with us wherever here may be. The folks that are here, thank you. And thank you for cooperating as we uh, stumble through our first uh, uh, service back. And we look forward to more. Whether you're on the Zoom teleconference or you're on the uh, Facebook, we are glad that you're with us as well. Hope you have a blessed week. And look forward to seeing you again next week. Hear this benediction. May the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now rise and go into peace to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you this day and abide with you evermore. Amen.